Hey, Jody here. This video is about TIG welding aluminum and amplitude settings as well as waveform and even mixed waveform. Recently I visited my friend Mike Zancanato, Zancanato Custom Cycles. Mike's a custom bike builder. Mike's got a lot to say about what he has learned works for him on these bike welds as far as amplitude settings and waveforms and things like that. I think you'll find it really interesting. So we'll get done with the welding and then I'll sit down with Mike and we'll, we'll hash out all the details about amplitude, triangle wave, and things like that. Let's do it. Okay, first thing, the tubes are notched on this fixture and a Bridgeport mill, and then after they're notched, they're deburred, given a really good wipe down with Scotch-Brite, and then a final really good wipe down with reagent grade alcohol inside and out. All right, pay attention to something right here. It's subtle, but, but I'm gonna call attention to it. Mike pulses with the foot pedal, and the reason for that is, constantly having to rotate the torch to keep a decent torch angle and so while he lets off that gives him a second to reposition the, the, rotate his wrist get a favorable angle that way the torch is never leaning back too far so it's positioned in a fixture for welding after it's all tack welded up in the lineup fixture so this is a mock-up right here just positioned in that fixture we're not going to weld the whole bike just the uh, just the head tube here I think that's what it's called the the, uh, the pulsing with the pedal here a little bit if you pay attention be plenty of arc shots coming up and we will go over the settings the exact settings used sort of at the end of the video where we sit down and talk about all those kind of things using a number eight Furic Pro here mainly two reasons number one it's a really good cup it helps you see where you're going but also it's really nice for filming it really kind of lights the whole way so you can not only just see the puddle but we can see the seam we can see a few ripples behind it and everything so but I, I would wouldn't hesitate to use this particular cup for this application anyway because it just works good again the, the pedal pulsing uh, he's not letting off a whole lot just enough so that he doesn't build up and get out of hand while he's repositioning the torch angle A lot of guys in motorsports, and this is very similar to motorsports applications like roll cages and chassis and things like that, a lot of those guys pulse with the pedal. And the reason they do it with the pedal is because if they get hung up a little bit, if, if their glove hangs on something or they just can't quite get positioned, that pulse isn't coming automatically. It only comes when they want it to come. So it's a very popular technique. I think it's a good technique for these type applications. Here's a good shot of it. You can see sometimes you can actually, when you get a when you get a bad angle, you can actually sort of look through the cup and see where you're going to feed wire. That's another benefit. Again, this is a mock-up here. This is not a not an entire frame, but if it was a frame, this would be going to paint after it was all cleaned up. So this little little broad band of uh, cleaning outside the the bead, not an issue. Rather have that and have a nice clean puddle then uh, narrow that band down for aesthetics. That's my opinion anyway, and Mike's too, I guess. A little, a little swirl as he adds another little dab of rod to avoid a crater crack as he tapers off the amperage. And so that joint is done now. Hey, this is Mike Zancanato. We had Mike on the Welding Tips and Tricks podcast a while back, a good while back. And, uh, Oh, for those of you that don't know, I do a podcast. <laughs> it's called the Welding Tips and Tricks Podcast. I do it with Roy Crumrein and Jonathan Lewis. And about every other week we have a guest. Mike was our guest. And we talked about a lot of things when it comes to bike building. But the one thing that stands out, I think, is uh, Mike's take on the amplitude settings on the wave shape forms and the settings that some of the newer machines have. In this case, the Dynasty 280. Okay. okay. I've got a Dynasty 280, Mike's got a Dynasty 280, Mike ponied up for the expansion card, I still haven't. So, in other words, I can't do what he does with his machine because, you know, because I'm not willing to part with the $500 just yet. <laughs> but what it does is it allows you to adjust, you know, uh, adjust amperage on each side of the alternating current. So you can adjust the amperage on the EN side, the electrode negative side, and you can adjust it on the EP side. So I'm going to get Mike to weigh in and uh, talk about what he has learned because he did a lot of trial and error and came up with settings that worked for his application. When I first got 
the expansion pack, um, what was most interesting to me, I thought, was everything is touted by Miller and a couple of the other companies that you can set your electronegative current higher to get more heat into the part, but then turn your electropositive current down to preserve your tungsten and mm -hmm. still get enough cleaning. Um, you would then adjust your cleaning with your balance. So you've got current and then you've got time, which is your balance. So what I was finding though in my particular application, which was really frustrating, I would, I would set the EN higher than the EP, but then I wasn't getting nearly the cleaning that I needed. Because that's what um, they recommended. Right, yeah, that was... Yeah. They like, touted that so you could use a smaller electrode and get more penetration, but right, yeah. Yep. Um, so I started to think about, all right, well, I've already spent the money on this expansion bag. Let's see if we can actually make it work. So then I got to thinking, okay, well, what's more important for your cleaning action? Is it, is it the amps or is it the time? Um, time being, again, being balanced. So I started to experiment. First, I started, I went about 10% above with the EP amps compared to the EN. So for instance, I would set the machine at 220 amps on the EP side, 200 amps on the EN. And I saw a marked difference right away. I was, I was getting much better at cleaning. Um, but this, at that point, I was keeping my balance in that six, I had to go down to 65 to 70% when mm -hmm. I had the EN higher. Yeah. So I started to go creep up with the balance and creep up with the EP amps. Um, and I got to a point where I was 20 or 30% higher. For instance, I would just max out the machine at 280 amps on the EP side. Um, and then I would set the EN at about 230. And I was able to turn my balance, in some cases with really nice material, up to about 90%. That's crazy. Yeah. And what that then allowed me to do is I could even come down from a 332nd electrode to a 116th if I was doing some pretty delicate stuff. Yeah. Um, and it was preserving the tip of that electrode. So for me, what I think it helped show was that I think cleaning is more a function of amps than time. But tungsten erosion is certainly more a function of time. The, high, the lower your balance, in this case, towards you know lower um, EN percent, you're going to erode the tungsten more. Yeah. Well, so. if you could if you could use a one sixteenth tungsten, and I, it's hard to tell your, what your amps are. Yeah, I wasn't. I wasn't using all that. All right. But you're probably using. still 130 or 140 yeah. amps. With the At least, yeah, yeah, I would say probably closer to you know 160 or 175 in some cases. Yeah, you can't do that so. with a 116th electrode without those settings that you determined. I could, I never could. I mean, even on a sinker wave, with a with a with the AC balance set on maybe seven mm -hmm. set, which is not 70 percent on the sinker no, wave. No. But I wouldn't probably go over 85 amps or 90 amps with a 116th electrode. Yeah. I'd risk Jumping. quivering and falling and falling in the puddle. Right? You don't right. want that. So that's interesting. Yeah. So basically, you, you flip the script on. <laughs> no, I don't well, mean. You yeah, just no, thought outside the box. Right, right. And I think I think that's what's important is just because the machine manufacturers are telling you that they think this is ideal, I think it's really up to the user to figure out for their particular application, or even just a totally different mindset, different yeah. paradigm that you're um, experimenting and trying to figure out uh, what what's best for your application. Like for instance, for myself too. I know that most guys with aluminum, they're running as low a pre-flow as possible because they're trying to save gas. But I know for me, running a second and a half to two seconds stabilizes mm -hmm. that arc. It, it creates a nice initial, um, I don't get any sooting yeah. on that restart. That's, see, that's something I learned just recently too, after all these years. And I, I, I about a second and a half for me, mm -hmm. for what I was doing at, at that particular time, but two seconds, a half or more second of, uh, Preflow is not going to break the bank, right? Nope. You know, right. and if it gives you a start with no soot, no brownish area, a clean start, right. that's just visually appealing. When you get finished, you can't hardly tell your stops and starts that way. You right. know, right. it's a big deal. Yeah. So, yeah, you came, you came, you came in working with that thing with an open mind, and you discovered something. So that's 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 a lesson in itself. That's yeah. Just don't believe something just because it's on a forum or you know just going back folklore. Yeah. 
um, just yeah, an experiment. Um, I like, no matter what they recommend, if you're getting black spots and stuff in the crusty puddle, well, what's that extra penetration? You can't, you can't, you can't tolerate that. So you got to have a clean puddle to start with. But then, what if you if you can go from there and narrow the pinpoint the arc a little bit, or narrow up the cleaning edge line, mm -hmm. or things like that, then you're okay as long as that puddle stays clean, right? Yes. Yep. That's main Absolutely. for me too. And I know in bike building, it, it's probably huge. Aesthetics are everything. Yeah. Right. And just to quickly summarize some of my other settings, if it's helpful for for other okay. people. Um, so again, like I'll do two seconds on the pre-flow. I'm running a number eight cup on a small gas lens. I just find that's more consistent for me, running at about 18 to 20 CFH. Um, I will turn down the post flow to about five seconds as long as the tungsten is staying clean. Yep. That's fine. Um, I do like running my frequency between uh, 90 to 120 hertz. I do like how it helps the puddle flow out especially at the toes of the weld into the tube, nice mm -hmm. and smooth. Um, and with the 280, with the expansion pack, you can actually tailor both sides of the arc with the waveform. So I'll do triangular wave on the EN to help prevent um, peeling away some of those thin wall um, tube edges. Mm -hmm. But then to get more punch on the cleaning, I'll actually use advanced square wave on the EP side. Okay. So, um, and again, like balance, like we said before, anywhere from 75 to 90 percent EN depending mm -hmm. on the material and the application. Cool. So, yeah. Cleanliness on aluminum, you gave the sweet spot settings that you found. They're kind of unconventional, but results are hard to argue with. You know? Yeah, yeah. So, so it's just good, it's just, just adding to the conversation. Somebody out there may have found some better settings using the different amplitude and different waveforms. So. Yeah. Please chime in if you have in the comments. We all would like to learn what you what you have found, and, and uh, that's how everybody gets better. Absolutely, right? Thanks, Jody. Thanks, Mike. All right. Thanks, Mike, for letting me hang out with you and let me film this video. See you guys next time.